Casella Staunton was the next to succumb, however, and she was but four and ten. Then Septa Merriam sickened, and Elaine Royce, an even big, boisterous Sam Stokeworth, who liked to boast that she had never been sick a day in her life. All three died the same night, within hours of one another. Reina Targaryen herself remained untouched, though her friends and dear companions were being felled one by one. It was her Valyrian blood that saved her, Maester Anselm suggested, ailments that carried off ordinary men in a matter of hours could not prevail against the blood of the dragon. Males also seemed largely immune to this queer plague. Aside from Maester Culiper, only women were struck down. The men of Dragonstone, be they knights, scullions, stableboys, or singers, remained healthy. Queen Reyna ordered the gates of Dragonstone closed and barred. As yet there was no sickness beyond her walls, and she meant for it to stay that way, to protect the small folk. When she sent word to King's Landing, Jaehaerys acted at once, commanding Lord Valerion to send forth his galleys to make certain no one escaped to spread the pestilence beyond the island. The King's hand did as commanded, though not without grief, for his own young niece was amongst the women still on Dragonstone. Lyanna Valerion died even as her uncle's galleys were pushing off from Driftmark. Maester Anselm had purged her, bled her, and covered her with ice, all to no avail. She died in Reyna Targaryen's arms, convulsing as the queen wept bitter tears. You weep for her, Andro Farman said when he saw the tears on his wife's face, but would you weep for me? His words woke a fury in the queen. Lashing him across the face, Reyna commanded him to leave her, declaring that she wanted to be alone. You shall be, Andro said. She was the last of them. Even then, so lost was the queen in her grief that she did not realize what had happened. It was Rego Draz, the king's pentoshi master of coin, who first gave voice to suspicion when Jaehaerys assembled his small council to discuss the deaths on Dragonstone. Reading over Maester Anselm's accounts, Lord Rego furrowed his brow and said, Sickness. This is no sickness. A weasel in the guts, dead in a day, this is the tears of Lee. Poison. King Jacaris said in shock. We know more of such things in the free cities, Draz assured him. It is the tears, never doubt it. The old maester would have seen it soon enough, so he had to die first. That is how I would do it. Not that I would. Poison is, dishonorable. Only women were struck down, objected Lord Valerion. Only women got the poison, then, said Rego Draz. When Septon Barth and Grand Maester Benefer concurred with Lord Rego's words, the king dispatched a raven to Dragonstone. Once Reyna Targaryen read his words, she had no doubt. Summoning the captain of her guards, she commanded that her husband be found and brought to her. Andro Farman was not to be found in his bedchamber nor the Queen's, nor the Great Hall, nor the stables, nor the Sept, nor Aegon's garden. In Sea Dragon Tower, in the Maester's chambers under the rookery, they discovered Maester Anselm dead, with a dagger between his shoulder blades. With the gates closed and barred, there was no way to leave the castle save by dragon. My worm of a husband does not have the courage for that, Reyna declared. Andro Farman was located at last in the chamber of the painted table, a longsword clutched in his grasp. He made no attempt to deny the poisonings. Instead he boasted. I brought them cups of wine, and they drank. They thanked me, and they drank. Why not? A cupbearer, a serving man, that's how they saw me. Andro the sweet. Andro the jape. What could I do, but fall off the dragon? Well, I could have done a lot of things. I could have been a lord. I could have made laws and been wise and given you counsel. I could have killed your enemies, as easily as one killed your friends. I could have given you children. Reyna Targaryen did not deign to reply to him. Instead she spoke to her guards, saying, take him and geld him, but staunch the wound. I want his cock and balls fried up and fed to him. Do not let him die until he has eaten every bite. No, Andro Farman said, as they moved around the painted table to grasp him. My wife can fly, and so can L. And so saying, he slashed ineffectually at the nearest man, back to the window behind him, and leapt out. His flight was a short one, downward, to his death. Afterward Reyna Targaryen had his body hacked to pieces and fed to her dragons. His was the last notable death of 54 AC, but there was still more ill to come in the terrible year of the stranger. Just as a stone thrown into a pond will send out ripples in all directions, the evil that Andro Farman had wrought would spread across the land, touching and twisting the lives of others long after the dragons were done feasting on his blackened, smoking remains. The first ripple was felt in the king's own small council, 
when Lord Demon Valerian announced his desire to step down as Hand of the King. Queen Alyssa, it will be recalled, had been Lord Demon's sister, and his young niece Liana had been amongst the women poisoned on Dragonstone. Some have suggested that rivalry with Lord Manfred Redwin, who had replaced him as Lord Admiral, played a part in Lord Demon's decision, but this seems a petty aspersion to cast at a man who served so ably and so long. Let us rather take his lordship at his word and accept that his advancing age and a desire to spend his remaining days with his children and grandchildren on Driftmark were the cause of his departure. J. Harris's first thought was to look to the other members of his council for Lord Demon's successor. Albin Massey, Rego Draz, and Septon Barth had all shown themselves to be men of great ability, earning the king's trust and gratitude. None, however, seemed wholly suitable. Septon Barth was suspected of having greater loyalty to the Starry Sept than to the Iron Throne. Moreover, he was of very low birth, the great lords of the realm would never allow the son of a blacksmith to speak with the king's voice. Lord Rego was a godless Pentoshi and an upjumped spicemonger, and his birth was, if anything, even lower than Septon Barth's. Lord Albin, with his limp and twisted back, would strike the ignorant as somehow sinister. They look at me and see a villain, Massey himself told the king. I can serve you better from the shadows. There could be no question of bringing back Rogar Baratheon nor any of King Mager's surviving hands. Lord Tully's term upon the council during the regency had been undistinguished. Roderick Aaron, Lord of the Airy and Defender of the Vale, was a boy of ten, having come untimely into his lordship after the deaths of his uncle Lord Darnold and his sire Sir Raimond at the hands of the wildling raiders they had unwisely pursued into the Mountains of the Moon. Jaharis had but recently reached an understanding with Donald Hightower, but still did not entirely trust the man, no more than he did Lyman Lannister. Bertrand Tyrell, the Lord of Highgarden, was known to be a drunkard, whose unruly bastard sons would bring disgrace down on the crown if turned loose upon King's Landing. Alaric Stark was best left in Winterfell, a stubborn man by all reports, stern and hard-handed and unforgiving, he would make for an uncomfortable presence at the council table. It would be unthinkable to bring an Iron Man to King's Landing, of course, with none of the great lords of the realm being found. Suitable, Jaharis next turned to their lord's bannerman. It was thought desirable that the hand be an older man, whose experience would balance the king's youth. As the council included several learned men of bookish inclination, a warrior was wanted as well, a man blooded and tested in battle whose martial reputation would dishearten the crown's enemies. After a dozen names had been put forward and bandied about, the choice finally fell to Sir Miles Smallwood, Lord of Acorn Hall in the Riverlands, who had fought for the king's brother, Aegon, beneath the god's eye, battled Wathi Hewer at Stonebridge, and ridden with the late Lord Stokeworth to bring Heron the Red to justice during the reign of King Aenys. Justly famed for his courage, Lord Miles wore the scars of a dozen savage fights upon his face and body. Sir Willem the Wasp of the Kingsguard, who had served at Acorn Hall, swore there was no finer, fiercer, or more leal lord in all the seven kingdoms, and Prentice Tully and the redoubtable Lady Lucinda, his liege lords, had not but praise for Smallwood as well. Thus persuaded, Jaharis gave his assent, a raven took wing, and within the fortnight, Lord Miles was on his way to King's Landing, Queen Alisan played no part in the selection of the King's Hand. Whilst the King and Council were deliberating, her grace was absent from King's Landing, having flown Silverwing to Dragonstone to be with her sister and comfort her in her grief. Reyna Targaryen was not a woman easily comforted, however. The loss of so many of her dear friends and companions had plunged her into a black melancholy, and even the mention of Andro Farman's name provoked her to fits of rage. Far from welcoming her sister and whatever solace she might bring, Reyna thrice tried to send her away, even going so far as to scream at her grace in view of half the castle. When the queen refused to go, Reyna retreated to her own chambers and barred the doors, emerging only to eat. Not in that less and less often. Left to her own devices, Alisand Targaryen set about restoring a modicum of order to Dragonstone. A new maester was sent for and installed, a new captain appointed to take charge of the castle garrison. The queen's own beloved Septa Edith arrived to assume the place of Reyna's much-lamented Septa Merriam. Shunned by her sister, Alisand turned to her niece, but there too she encountered rage and rejection. Why should I care if they're all dead? She'll find new ones, she always does, Princess Arya told the queen. When Alisand tried to share stories of her own girlhood, and told of how Reyna had put a dragon's egg into her cradle and cuddled and cared for her, as if she were my mother, Arya said, 
She never gave me an egg, she just gave me away and flew off to Fair Isle. Alisan's love for her own daughter provoked the princess to anger as well. Why should she be queen? I should be queen, not her. It was then that Arya broke down into tears at last, pleading with Alisan to take her back with her to King's Landing. Lady Alyssa said that she would take me, but she went away and forgot me. I want to come back to court, with the singers and the fools and all the lords and knights. Please take me with you. Moved by the girl's tears, Queen Alisan could do no more than promise to take the matter up with her mother. When Reyna next emerged from her chambers to take a meal, however, she rejected the notion out of hand. You have everything and I have nothing. Now you would take my daughter too. Well, you shall not have her. You have my throne, content yourself with that. That same night Reyna summoned Princess Arya to her chambers to berate her, and the sounds of mother and daughter shouting at one another rang through the stone drum. The princess refused to speak to Queen Alisan after that. Stymied at every turn, her grace finally returned to King's Landing, to the arms of King Jaehaerys and the merry laughter of her own daughter, Princess Daenerys. As the year of the stranger neared its end, work on the dragon pit was all but complete. The great dome in place at last, the massive bronze gates hung, the cavernous edifice dominated the city from the crown of Rhaenys's hill, second only to the red keep upon Aegon's high hill. To mark its completion and celebrate the arrival of the new hand, Lord Redwin proposed to the king that they stage a great tourney, the largest and grandest the realm had seen since the Golden Wedding. Let us put our sorrows behind us and begin the new year with pageantry and celebration, Redwin argued. The autumn harvests had been good, Lord Rigo's taxes were bringing in a steady stream of coin, trade was on the increase, paying for the tourney would not be a concern, and the event would bring thousands of visitors, and their purses, to King's Landing. The rest of the council was all in favor of the proposal, and King Jaehaerys allowed that a tourney might indeed give the small folk something to cheer, and help us forget our woes. All such preparations were thrown into disarray by the sudden and unexpected arrival of Reyna Targaryen from Dragonstone. It may well be that dragons somehow sense, and echo, the moods of their riders, Septon Barth wrote, for Dreamfire came down out of the clouds like a raging storm that day, and Vermithor and Silverwing rose up and roared at her coming, such wise that all of us who saw and heard were fearful that the dragons were about to fly at one another with flame and claw, and tear each other apart as Valerian once did to Quicksilver by the god's eye. The dragons did not, in the end, fight, though there was much hissing and snapping as Reyna flung herself off Dreamfire and stormed into Mager's Holfast, shouting for her brother and her sister. The source of her fury was soon known. Princess Arya was gone. She had fled Dragonstone as dawn broke, stealing into the yards and claiming a dragon for her own. And not just any dragon. Balerion. Reyna exclaimed. She took Balerion, the mad child. No hatchling for her, no, not her, she had to have the black dread. Mager's dragon, the beast that slew her father. Why him, if not to pain me? What did I give birth to? What kind of beast? I ask you, what did I give birth to? A little girl, Queen Alisan said, she is just an angry little girl. But Septon Barth and Grand Maester Benefer tell us that Reyna did not seem to hear her. She was desperate to know where her, mad child, might have fled. Her first thought had been King's Landing, Arya had been so eager to return to court. But if she was not here, where? We will learn that soon enough, I suspect, King Jaehaerys said, as calm as ever. Valerian is too big to hide or pass unnoticed and he has a fearsome appetite. He turned to Grand Maester Benefer then, and commanded that ravens be sent forth to every castle in the Seven Kingdoms. If any man in Westeros should so much as glimpse Valerian or my niece, I want to know at once. The ravens flew, but there was no word of Princess Arya that day, or the day after, or the day after that. Reyna remained at the Redkeep all the while, sometimes raging, sometimes shaking, drinking sweet wine to sleep. Princess Daenerys was so frightened by her aunt that she cried whenever she came into her presence. After seven days Reyna declared that she could no longer sit here idle. I need to find her. If I cannot find her, at least I can look. So saying, she mounted Dreamfire and was gone. Neither mother nor daughter was seen or heard from again during what little remained of that. Cruel year, 